Hello. In this lecture, we will discuss uh, luck egalitarianism, uh, the article by Nicholas Berry. And to start off, uh, I should uh, point out that there's a kind of relationship between luck and what people deserve uh, that seems to be re reasonably commonsensical. Uh, and that is, there seems to be an inverse relationship between luck and dessert, right? This is the, uh, the dessert with one S, not the delicious kind. Um, and so, again, it's, this is, talks about what people deserve. And so generally, when there is more luck involved in acquiring a benefit, that benefit seems less deserved. Uh, less luck involved in acquiring a benefit uh, seems to sort of enhance the deservingness. So um, imagine that we had a coin tossing tournament uh, in, in the class and uh, everyone, you know, it was just, you know, it was a, make up a bracket and, you know, whoever wins moves on. Well, there's guaranteed to be a winner. OK, but the winner, of course, is, is a winner by pure luck. And so this is, is so think of yourself, is this the sort of thing that you'd put on a resume? Right. It's a yes, I was the 2019 coin toss champion of the of, of, of the class. Right. Uh, probably not, because, again, it's entirely luck. Right. There's no sense of um, there's no sense of skill involved. Um, and, you know, and, and so because the win is entirely luck, uh, there's a sense in which nothing is really deserved. There's no real merit in it. Uh, Whereas if we had something like a chess tournament and, you know, winning that all of a sudden seems to be the sort of thing that you might uh, you might think of, of bragging about at least a little bit, uh, because there's uh, there's really no luck involved in chess. It's a it's a it's a perfect information game of your skill. So um, uh, so this is the this there's this notion, of course, that uh, the more uh, uh, luck is involved, the less dessert there is involved. That is, they have this inverse relationship. And so it seems like uh, luck is one of those things that we certainly want to think about how it interacts with uh, our theories of distributive justice uh, or our thinking about distributive justice. And so to the extent that justice means getting what one deserves, right, dessert is certainly an important concept in justice, um, there should be some mechanisms in place that seem to that should maybe compensate individuals for their bad luck. Uh, and it seems like the most reasonable way to do that is by skimming from the good luck of others. And so this is a real question. Should a society uh, try and minimize the effects of bad luck uh, uh, or even and even good luck? Try, should, should a society try and even things out a little bit so that luck isn't what's making the biggest difference between people's levels of well-being? Because, again, remember, if somebody is having a really great life uh, that just out of pure luck, that, that's not necessarily something that they earned or that they deserve in some sense. And again, if, if a just society is one where people are getting what they deserve, then again, perhaps minimizing luck should be a deal. And so let's take a look at our two theories of justice and how they, uh, how they, they interact with uh, the notion of luck. Of course, uh, Rawls, remember, uh, says that the just society is the one that would be chosen from behind the veil of ignorance. That is, uh, it's the society that would be chosen by anybody without them actually knowing who they would be in society or what kind of a person they are. Uh, the idea is they just look at overall and they see, you know, which, uh, you know, is a society acceptable uh, from from that uh, sort of from that basis. And and remember, uh, Rawls thinks that societies should be uh, fairly equal, should should value equality, but he doesn't say that everything has to be in fact equal. But any inequalities should be in principle to available in principle available to everyone, and should also be of benefit to all, or at least to the least advantaged, right? And so it seems like if some amount of luck uh, would happen to uh, could be left in place only if it benefited the least advantaged or tended to benefit everybody. But kinds of luck that maybe don't pass that test. And it seems like most kinds of luck really don't pass that test. Um, uh, they, they, uh, that, that luck often doesn't necessarily favor everybody and certainly doesn't necessarily favor the least advantaged. Um, in fact, I think that uh, in a lot of ways, people who already have some advantages are more likely to be able to take advantage of strokes of luck when they occur. Um, and so Rawls's theory really is one that does take this idea of trying to compensate people for luck or trying to even out the effects of luck much more seriously than our other major theory, which is, of course, Nozick's theory. And remember, Nozick says that the just society is the one in which all holdings are justly acquired and justly transferred. And for Nozick, the presence or absence of luck in acquiring or transferring a holding does not render those holdings unjust. 
right? So um, if you just happen to, to stumble upon something and happen to acquire it, uh, you know, and it's sort of luck that you had the opportunity to acquire it, that doesn't mean that you didn't acquire it justly, right? So uh, for Nozick, uh, luck in acquisition or luck in transfer, um, it just doesn't really affect the justice of the transfer or the justice of the acquisition. The Nozick's theory, to a great extent, uh, really doesn't doesn't regard luck as something to uh, to worry about at all. Right? Doesn't regard it as relevant uh, to uh, to justice. While Rawls's theory really does uh, regard luck as relevant to justice. Uh, and again, this is partially because of the the more fundamental disagreement between them. If you tend to think of justice as an outcome, then you're going to see outcomes generated by luck as being problems. For, for a just society. Uh, whereas if you uh, look instead at process, uh, you know, you're probably not as likely to see luck as a, as a problem. And so uh, on that backdrop, uh, remember Rawls Rawlsian theories tend to be strongly egalitarian. That means they tend to value equality highly. And so that brings us to the title of the piece, uh, uh, which is luck egalitarianism. Uh, Luck egalitarianism uh, is a kind of Rawlsian view, and it's the view that a just society should seek to minimize the impact of luck on the lives of its members. All right. And one important term that gets used in, in, uh, uh, in Barry's article here quite a lot uh, is this notion of compensability, okay? Uh, because the idea is this, uh, that not all luck should necessarily be addressed by society. Again, imagine having a harmless, you know, coin toss tournament for this, that, or the other thing, uh, or uh, having, you know, uh, deciding uh, based on a coin flip or uh, rock, paper, scissors on uh, who's going to pay for dinner this time, or who's going to get the next round of beers or something like that. And it seems like, yeah, these are all uh, areas where we perfectly well accept luck. Certainly, maybe lottery tickets shouldn't necessarily be outlawed, or or, or raffles uh, for you know for elementary school fundraisers, etc. Right. So there's a lot of things where we might choose to be uh, subject to luck for the purposes of entertainment or things like that. And so it seems like not all luck should simply be eliminated by some society. Again, this is this is way too way too far. Um, and so. The idea, though, is instead that when some result of luck is the sort of thing that society should adjust for, it is called compensable luck, right? So there certainly are some things. So imagine, again, some people uh, are born very poor, uh, and, and that's just bad luck for them, right? And, and so that seems obvious to be the kind of thing that a just society should try and address, um, at least uh, from a, an egalitarian point of view. And so one of Barry's main questions is which kinds of luck are indeed compensable, because some seem clearly non-compensable and some seem that they, they should be something that uh, a society should address. So the kind of luck that a society should address is what we mean by compensable. Okay? So it's compensable if society should address it and not if it shouldn't. So again, uh, there are lots of proposals uh, for how to tell the difference between compensable and non-compensable luck, and these uh, proposals are as uh, one very famous one is one by a philosopher named Ronald Dworkin, uh, and, and Dworkin makes a very famous distinction between what he calls option luck and brute luck. Right? Option luck is the luck that results from various different choices uh, that individuals make, okay? while brute luck is the luck that is not the result of any deliberate gamble. Right. So uh, Dworkin provides a couple of uh, examples in the quote that uh, in this article. Uh, and so uh, an example of option luck might be sort of losing money in a stock market, right? Uh, so it seems like, again, that's that's something somebody chose to buy certain stocks. They chose to invest in a certain way. They chose not to sell the stocks. So, so this is, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, but of course, they don't control themselves what happens to that stock, right? It's, you know, that's, in, in a sense, a matter of luck uh, for them. And so say they buy a particular stock and they end up losing money on that stock, that, that fits Dworkin's definition of what's called option luck, right? It's a luck that results from a, a, a deliberate choice that an individual makes. Uh, whereas brute luck is sort of being hit by a meteor, right? Now, of course, one could have moved had they known the meteor was going to hit in a certain place uh, or could have changed their daily routine or something like that. But of course, they had no reason to do such a thing. And so being hit by a meteor is again, um, it, it, it's just a matter of, that's just a matter of what some people call that dumb luck, right? Uh, and and, and the, the phrase is reasonable. Okay? So uh, that's brute luck. And so Dworkin's proposal is that is that brute luck should be compensated, 
right? That there should be something in, in play to try and iron out the effects of just plain old brute bad luck, right? But not so much option luck. So that we should, uh, a society should worry about the kinds of bad luck that happened to people that they couldn't possibly have, you know, that was not the result of any deliberate choice of theirs. Um, and they sh that uh, society should not really worry about luck that was the result of some deliberate choices. Of now, this sounds perfectly sensible, and lots of, of elements of it are perfectly sensible, but Barry really wants to question uh, the ultimate sensibility of at least um, uh, the way that uh, Dworkin draws this distinction. And so he points out to a couple of problems for this brute luck, option luck distinction. So one of the examples that Barry uses, he says, when two gamblers take the same risk and it pays off differently, the two have benefited unequally, even though they took the same risk. And so again, by gamblers, uh, don't necessarily think of two people who go to a casino, because again, part of the idea of a casino is to is to intentionally put yourself at the mercy of pure randomness for entertainment value. And so again, it, it, it sort of seems like having you know more than one outcome there is, is part of it. So again, by gambler, don't necessarily think gambler in a casino. Think gambler in the sense of somebody who decides to buy a stock or take a particular job or move to a particular town or something like that. Um, and, and, and that's the idea. Uh, even though even though one of the examples that Barry uses is like you know gambling at a racetrack or something like that, I, I feel like he could have used maybe a, a better example that that wasn't necessarily deliberate gambling in, in that sense. Um, but the idea is that again, if two people again buy the the same stock in the stock market because they were looking at the same figures, looking at the same numbers, looking at the same tech industry, you know, or or bought similar stocks, you know, uh, and then one of them happened to do well, one of them happened to do badly. Again, it seems like the two have really taken the same risk, made the same kind of choice, but then benefited unequally from from going through things very much the same way. I think a better example might be something like this. Uh, imagine two drivers, each, both of them are texting while driving, but only one of them happens to hit someone uh, on their route, on the, on the way. Now, of course, uh, one of them, they've, they've fared unequally from taking the exact same risk. In some sense, they are both equally negligent. It's just that only one of them uh, has, has managed to, uh, you know, cause harm, might have managed to, uh, you know, be in a really bad situation, which will then probably be prosecuted and uh, very severely punished. And so again, uh, is the is the different payoff that each get in these cases is that deserved, right? You know, it, again, it seems like uh, there's some sense of of luck, right? Certainly, uh, the negligent drivers aren't controlling who does or doesn't step out in front of their car, or who does or doesn't end up being in a place where they're you know where they're not paying attention to. They're both equally negligent, and it seems just a matter of luck uh, that one of them has hit somebody and the other one is not. And so again, it seems odd to say that they, they sort of, one of them deserves to be, you know, not to be punished for their negligence, and the other one does deserve to be punished for their negligence. And here's another problem that Barry identifies, aside from the unequal benefits problem. And this is the problem of background inequality, right? And uh, this is where what he talks about. This is background inequality is inequality in people's starting conditions, right? And Barry points out that background inequality can make certain choices either unavailable or much less likely. And so one example uh, that he gives is somebody growing up with less money may not be able to gamble and thus benefit in the stock market, while someone from a family with lower education levels may not value education as much as another. And again, so maybe the choice to pursue as much education may not be entirely genuine. Right? So the idea is that uh, depending on, on people's initial uh, starting locations that, that they, they may certain choices may be more or less available or more or less likely again and, and people's background inequality again we want to point out this looks like a matter of just basic brute luck not so much option luck but yet that uh, you know where somebody starts in life very much affects what kinds of choices what kinds of gambles they may decide to make later and so those decisions aren't necessarily entirely uh, you know uh, just pure decisions. They may be very heavily influenced by luck, by somebody's starting positions. And so both of these are problems saying, well, let's uh, compensate brute luck, but not option luck, right? Because again, it seems like reality is more complicated than that. So here's a, a quote from the article. Uh, it says this, it says, however, the equal footing proviso leads to a more radically egalitarian notion of responsibility than Dworkin would be prepared to accept. 
Underlying this proviso is the idea that it is unfair to hold individuals equally responsible for the consequences of decisions taken in unequal circumstances. If these unequal circumstances directly affect the decision-making process. But if luck egalitarians wish to prevent this sort of unfairness, they must extend the equal footing proviso to cover non-material inequalities which influence choices such as parental attitudes and not simply inequalities in the distribution of income and wealth. So this is a, an interesting proposal. It says that these background conditions not only should include uh, the distribution of things like income and wealth, which uh, sometimes happen to people by pure luck, um, you know, if they happen to be born into a family that has those sorts of things versus not, uh, but also uh, just based on various kinds of attitudes. Um, you know, if you're raised, you know, by in, in a household that sort of values education, you're more likely to choose more education. If you're raised in a, in a household that doesn't value education, you're less likely to choose it. Whether that that household is also very rich or very poor, uh, that, and, and and so it seems like uh, there's lots of these initial sort of background uh, uh, circumstances uh, that might influence somebody's choices to a point where we don't want to say that those choices weren't the result in some sense of luck as opposed to uh, these you know being sort of more genuine choices and so this notion of genuineness in choices brings us to um, uh, uh, Cohen's proposal right that uh, again Barry discusses uh, fairly uh, thoroughly and Cohen proposes that uh, that genuine chosen gambles are non-compensable and that uh, anything else uh, it falls under brute luck. That is, these sort of less chosen or, or unchosen gambles uh, and, and thus should be compensable. So there's a, a quote from Cohen here in the article and the quote goes this way. It says, the amount of genuineness that there is in a choice is a matter of degree and egalitarian redress is indicated to the extent that a disadvantage does not reflect genuine choice. That extent is a function of several things, and there is no aspect of a person's situation which is wholly due to genuine choice. And that's, that makes a very expansive view. Right? That means that there's an awful lot of stuff that the egalitarian really should address. Lots of different kinds of things are really affected by luck. And uh, uh, Cohen's going to say, if you're going to, uh, if, if, if you're going to consider some kind of, of choice or some kind of an outcome non-compensable, then it has to be pretty strict. It has to fit, you know, it has to be a, 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 as he calls it, a genuine chosen gamble, right? The, the idea is that there has to be some, uh, some, some sense in which the person really does, is, is absolutely free to choose as they choose. Uh, there are not other elements of sort of luck uh, limiting their choices or limiting which options they find to be more attractive uh, and, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, so the idea is that uh, brute luck is going to just be considered to be a lot more extensive uh, than it is in Dworkin's proposal. And so um, uh, some example, um, uh, this is one offered up by Barry. Uh, so he says, if an individual is offered two jobs, one safe but poorly paid, and the other dangerous but highly paid, he might choose the dangerous one, but only because his parents are impoverished and in need of his financial support. The family of his equally risk-averse friend, on the other hand, is well off, and his friend chooses the safer job. In this situation, both individuals can avoid the dangerous job, but the, difference, the different decisions they make are not equally genuine. Right. So this is something that any society should be very concerned about. Uh, certainly, like in terms of you know workplace conditions, uh, you know, in, in including like safety and how fulfilling a job is. Um, the idea is that sometimes people might be pressured into taking certain kinds of jobs or keeping certain kinds of jobs, not because they really want them, but because they feel as if uh, they have really little choice, uh, or or that their situation makes one kind of a choice much more attractive than another, uh, or makes another kind of choice really impractical. Um, and so if that's the case, how much of a choice is it really? Uh, and that's the kind of thing that Cohen wants to focus on. Is how much of a choice is it really? And so the idea is once you even out all of this background inequality uh, that has put people on a truly even footing, then if they make different choices, they can be fully responsible for what happens as a result of those things. But again, if they're starting from a position of, of, of remarkable difference, where that difference can really uh, impact how well each of their lives go for them, uh, that uh, to some, some degree seems unfair 
right? And, 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 a, and an egalitarian view would certainly try and fix that to the greatest extent possible. And so Cohen's proposal absolutely does address the problem of background or starting point inequality, but it doesn't quite go enough, far enough for Barry. Uh, Barry says it does not address the problem raised earlier about those who make the same choices getting different outcomes. And so if you think of the, the gamblers at the track, or for example, the two uh, negligent drivers, uh, those who are both texting and driving, uh, it, again, it seems like uh, even Cohen's focus on this uh, genuineness of choice doesn't necessarily uh, uh, address the problem about how sometimes people who can make the exact same kind of choice, uh, you know, uh, in exactly the same kind of circumstances uh, could, by pure luck, uh, get different outcomes. And so Barry's proposal is something like this, that, that darn near all luck is going to be compensable in some way or other. Um, and uh, he, you know, he specifies uh, some of the places where luck really does influence how our lives go for us. And I've, I've highlighted some of the key words in some of these, these quotes that we'll take a look at. And so he says, first, our lives can be impoverished or worsened by unchosen factors, such as inherited wealth or hereditary illness, and because our exposure to these factors is unchosen, their impact on our well-being is entirely the result of luck and fully compensable. So the thought here is that anything you're born with is by definition not something you chose, right? So there's no degree of choice of any kind involved in, in, in what sort of situation you're born into. And so if we want a more equal society or a more fair society, it seems like the idea is that we ought to uh, to the greatest, the greatest extent practical, make sure that these these kinds of things, the, the factors that people are, are born with, are compensated for in some way, are evened out a little bit, and, and luck isn't such a factor there. Uh, it seems like that would at least start people out uh, on a fair basis, and that's a, a, a very much, it's very much an egalitarian notion. Um, and, and, and most egalitarians would agree with this, um, and, you know, Barry's going to add a couple more factors, right, that a, a, an egalitarian society, a society that chooses very much like Rawls would choose, uh, is going to do. So he puts it this way, he says, luck also plays a role when unchosen background conditions affect the choices we make. The most obvious example is when luck shapes the set of options we face. If one person ends up better off than others because she had better options to choose from, purely as a result of luck, then this inequality is luck-derived and fully compensable. Luck-derived background conditions may also affect the genuineness of a person's choice by limiting her ability to take up certain options. Right? So the, again, the thought here is that, uh, say, you know, you face an important life choice. The idea is if there's some element of luck, there's just some element of your situation that limits how genuine that choice is, then this should be the sort of thing that a just society would take take note of, would try and compensate for, and would try and put people, at, you know, even after people, sort of some, some, some distance after they're born even, into situations where they're choosing on an equal footing where they really do have meaningful choices to make, and then perhaps after they make such meaningful choices, maybe then uh, uh, the society doesn't necessarily have to worry about things. But uh, uh, Barry continues, he says, it is also possible that people will be ignorant of the full range of options available to them, or that they will misunderstand the likely consequences of these options. This is one reason luck egalitarians should focus on the extent to which outcomes are genuinely chosen. Individuals may genuinely choose particular options without a full understanding of their consequences, and in such cases, the options are genuinely chosen, but the outcomes of these options are not. And so again, the thought here is, is this is the furthest reaching of, of, the, of the provisions that he gives us for uh, luck egalitarianism, addressing this kind of inequality. Um, and, and again, the thought here is that people should uh, have some real understanding of the potential consequences, like the real risks of what they do before they can be held fully responsible for having actually chosen those outcomes. Um, and so again, this, this would uh, mean a very extensive role uh, for an egalitarian society in deciding what sorts of things uh, uh, the, the society should try and even out, right? And so people should, to the greatest extent possible or practical, uh, be aware of the various kinds of risks that they take or and, and the possible uh, outcomes and benefits of those risks. 
Um, and uh, again, if they're not, then largely these outcomes are the result of luck, as a, or in a sense, as a result of the person's situation or circumstances, rather than something like genuine choice. Right? If somebody just didn't, uh, couldn't possibly have known, or or um, uh, was you know insufficiently informed of a particular uh, of a particular risk or or possibility of a particular outcome, then it almost seems like it's not necessarily. It, Again, it's a common thought that, that those things wouldn't necessarily be somebody's fault, and if they're not their fault, then they shouldn't suffer from, for them. So again, those are uh, those are some of the the thoughts that Mary here has uh, about um, uh, about how extensive um, the protections uh, against bad luck essentially should be in a just society. And so I do this because um, I, I, I want to uh, sort of drive a bit of a wedge between uh, theories like Rawls's and theories like Nozick's, uh, because as Barry points out at the beginning of the article, uh, there's there's a lot of focus on, you know, there's a lot of folks uh, sort of sometimes retreat away from these very strongly egalitarian views because they do sort of want to hold people responsible for their choices. And I think uh, people like Barry rightly point out that you, you really can and should hold people responsible for their choices only when those choices were actually genuine choices. And he points out how often that's not really the case, uh, despite uh, what everyone would sort of love to believe. Uh, and so I think that if you uh, take a look at a theory like Rawls's, uh, you, you really do have to consider that if it's going to try and insulate people from the results of just pure luck, right, and it's going to try and take luck out of the equation, that this is pretty extensive. This is a very large scale and radical operation. And there are very good reasons for wanting to do this, but it is large scale and it is radical. And so I think that uh, gives some uh, motivation to a, a kind of opposing view uh, that might say, uh, best not even start down this path um, and uh, and not worry about luck being a, a real impact on whether a society is just or not. Again, the, the dispute's probably going to come down to something pretty fundamental. Uh, for example, whether you view justice as a kind of outcome or rather justice as a kind of procedure. If you view it as a kind of procedure, luck seems to be this the ordinary noise that happens with, with any set of procedures. Uh, if you view it as an outcome, it seems like uh, certainly uh, various kinds of luck uh, can cause people to make decisions for which they're not, you know, that aren't fully choices. They're not necessarily genuine options uh, that those people really have, uh, so that they perhaps don't deserve uh, some of the bad things that may happen to them as a result of exercising certain uh, certain of those uh, so-called choices. Uh, and so, in any case, uh, the the, the large-scale uh, difference here is that uh, theories like Rawls's uh, egalitarian theories should be prepared to take on luck to a, a very extreme degree if they're going to really satisfy their notion of fairness. Um, while uh, uh, something somebody like Nozick should have to be prepared, right, to defend their their um, you know defend the fact that they're not going to do so, right? Which again, it's 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 not radical, so there, there's that. Um, but it also seems that we do have some intuitions about not wanting people to have sort of, you know, unequal outcomes uh, just on the basis of plain old luck, right? Um, and to sort of believe in some sense that that's uh, fair in, in, a, in a grander way. And so the issue of luck is a, is a big one. It's an important one. And it's one in which our, our theories of justice very, very fundamentally uh, disagree about what to do about it.